Okay, well, why don't we get started? Um, thanks for coming to the application security track. Uh, I'm here to have the pleasure of introducing Steve Patton. Um, Steve is CISSP and he's a security architect for a large New England financial services firm. He's been interested in social networking sites since 2006 when a Columbia style school attack plan in Riverton, Kansas was found on MySpace and foiled. So uh, Steve is going to talk to us about social networking sites and investigative techniques. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> so um, this is a, a refactoring of, a, of a basically a training uh, that I give uh, where I work for uh, investigators, fraud investigators. Uh, and it usually becomes pretty interactive. Um, of course, when it becomes interactive, it blows out to about two hours. We have about 50 minutes. So, uh, but I do want to encourage uh, questions if you have any. So uh, feel free to make it interactive uh, if you've got something you want to delve into. Um, <coughs> I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are aware of uh, social networking sites. Uh, they're fabulously popular. Um, we have a Twitter site for the, for the conference, I hear. Um, and, uh, you know, these, these sites are proliferating and people are using them more and more frequently and there's, there's hundreds of millions of profiles out there. And for investigators, researchers, this is becoming an interesting area to look at. Uh, I know uh, fraud investigators that I've worked at are looking more and more at these sites uh, when they're investigating a case because they're finding, you know, people put their lives online these days. and uh, they can find very valuable information uh, when they're investigating something. And uh, there's a growing body of literature around, you know, what kind of person uses what kind of site and how often do they post and uh, all these kinds of things. So uh, researchers are also looking at a lot of these sites as well. Um, <coughs> and the amount of uh, material that people put on some of these sites, some users of these sites put on these sites uh, is just astonishing, almost scary. Um, and uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, I became interested in this area when um, there was a Columbine style attack plan found on a MySpace site and it was shut down and it hit CNN and I said, you know, I'd heard of MySpace but I'd never really been there. And, uh, but I started poking around this and um, uh, my first uh, foray into this was to uh, go to a local library presentation put on by the, by the local police about internet safety. Uh, and, you know, my wife said, oh, you've been talking about this MySpace stuff. You should ask them if this would interest them. And, uh, so, you know, there's this thing at the library. So I go to the library and, you know, 419 scam, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, don't click on the email, yeah, yeah, yeah. Finally, we get through the thing. And I talk to the sergeant and uh, I say, um, you know, I've been looking at, uh, MySpace and some of these sites and, you know, if there was a way to automate, you know, looking through some of these things, would that be of interest to you? And she was like, you got to come talk to the chief. <laughs> I was like, oh, I think I hit some pay dirt here. And she said, oh yeah, um, we, we have mapped all of the profiles of all of the high school students at the local high school who have a MySpace uh, profile because the stuff keeps coming up and up and up. She says, you know, we get a call from a resident. There's graffiti on my fence. She says, wait three minutes. You know, tick, 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 You know, and there's the picture <laughs> with the paint can. You know, come with me, right? Uh, so this, this kind of stuff um, is becoming a, a, a fertile area for law enforcement, for investigators, and uh, it's just happening more and more. Um, so I'm... Uh, I'm a security guy for a financial services company. Um, my job is, you know, to be sort of the anti-hacker there. Um, I'm not an investigator by trade or by training, but, um, you know, some of my technical expertise has been valuable to non-technical users uh, who need to get a better feel for these sites and how to navigate them. And that's, that's really the angle I'm taking here. So. Um, if you're highly technical, you know how websites are built, you know HTML back and forth, there may only be a few clues here. Um, if, you're, if you're a business person, you're an investigator, or you're, you're not really familiar with these sites, then you know, you'll probably pick up uh, 
some tips from this uh, presentation, and I, I hope it'll help you along. Um, just a, a brief review of the obvious ones that, uh, that are the, the heavy hitters, right? MySpace is the largest and best known of the social networking sites. Uh, Friendster was one of the first. Uh, Bebo, Zuka, uh, Facebook is probably, you know, number two and, and rivaling uh, MySpace these days. Um, <clears throat> and then there are different types, right? Classmates, which is, you know, reunion.com, these kinds of things that are sort of theme oriented by, by your class, your college, and this kind of thing. Um, and we could debate whether we should call YouTube a social networking site or not, but um, the whole class of sites that uh, post um, material that's made by the users of the site, you know, that's really how broad we should make the universe because when you're investigating and you're looking for stuff, you're going to find yourself running across all these kinds of different sites. Um, a lot of material can be found on the blogging sites, and they're, they're usually not considered, uh, you know, social networking sites per se, but um, I know many in this room would be familiar with uh, Blogger, WordPress, and so forth. Um, those are areas you've got to look to if you're looking for material, if you're looking for historical information, if you're looking for context about a person, right, you're going to find that in the various ways that they express themselves. And it may not all be on Facebook. Um, you know, there may be uh, other places you've got to look. Um, also, uh, the lines between the sites uh, are, can be pretty blurry. I mean, you can have a blog on MySpace. Um, so uh, these are not hard and fast categories. Um, the kind of stuff you're going to find, um, photos, um, friends, you can map friends. There's a, there's a tool that, uh, uh, that I just recently uh, saw, uh, I think uh, from uh, somebody in, uh, in Britain, that uh, will delve into profiles and do multiple layers and show you um, maps of friends and, you know, sh draw the lines between them. And so there's an emerging space for, uh, for tools for mapping these kinds of sites, uh, seeing what the relationships are, um, seeing where there's a circle of friends, this kind of thing. Um, and more and more tools are coming out around this area. And y you're going to find all kinds of information related to this, uh, photo albums, uh, video, um, blogs, um, messages between users in the circle of friends. Um, a lot of it, from an, from an investigator standpoint, is very valuable because you're going to find date and time stamps in a lot of these sites for when was the blog entry made, when was the message sent. Um, there's tools out there for conversation tracking, you know, between two users where it used to be you had to hop between the profiles to follow a conversation, but now you can kind of pull that uh, content out and, uh, and see the conversation in order. <coughs> this, uh, you know, not scientific results. Most of these uh, sites don't broadcast uh, exactly how many profiles they have. And if they do, they're not going to release it at the same time. So this is just to give you a feel for scale, right? Um, so you can see this, this helps you see how much bigger MySpace is, uh, almost, you know, twice as big as the next one down for uh, hits on Google. Um, <coughs> Facebook, I, you know, I asterisked that one because up until recently, um, unless you were a friend of somebody in Facebook, you couldn't see their profile. So you would expect that as kind of a closed community, you wouldn't, it wouldn't leak out quite as much as something like MySpace, which just leaks its guts all over the internet everywhere all the time. <clears throat> so who's interested in this stuff? Uh, well, uh, you know, as I said, when I give this to, uh, uh, to business people, uh, I try to remind them as parents, they should be concerned about these sites. 60% of 13 to 17 year olds uh, are reputed to have an SNS account. Um, as I said, local police using, are using these sites to keep tabs on stuff going on in their towns. Um, principals at schools have benefited by, um, you know, being aware, right, situational awareness of 
what their students are saying and who's interacting with who and uh, is there problematic activity. Um, yeah, I, uh, all the kids I know in, this, in the circle of friends of my 13-year-old are all over these sites. And uh, I'm sure it's, it, it must be pretty much the same for most other parents. Um, as I mentioned, local law enforcement uh, is using this for solving uh, petty crimes because, um, you know, the level of material that's put out there uh, enables them to basically uh, be looking over everybody's shoulder as they go through their days. Um, and uh, from a privacy standpoint, I mean, I, we, we know that, you know, the Internet really doesn't innately provide any privacy, right? That's why many of us showed up at the tour presentation. Um, but teenagers are just uh, alarmingly unaware. You know, they, they think if they put a, a profile out there that only their friends are going to look at it. Why? Well, because I only think to look at my friends. You know, they just don't connect the dots. And uh, so from, uh, from a personal safety standpoint, from a privacy standpoint, um, from, uh, you know, from all these aspects, um, these are issues that parents should be concerned about. Um, you know, I, I certainly don't uh, advocate some of the calls, uh, you know, to boot young people off these sites, but um, because that's not the answer, they'll just find another way. But I think that, um, you know, we need to help people understand, we need to help teenagers understand how they're exposing themselves when they use these sites and, and just to be smart about uh, what they post. Back to that local police sergeant, she was telling me, you know, a sad story about a um, 20 something year old woman put her cell phone uh, number on the um, on on her profile and now she gets anonymous calls um, you know you look nice when you were walking out to your car after work last night and things like this and you know the, there's five police departments trying to work on this for her and they they can't you know they can't track it down they can't nail it so again you know people don't realize uh, how much information uh, they're putting out there. Two-edged sword, like many of these things, right? From a, an investigator's standpoint, this is great because <laughs> we can see tons of stuff and people are unguarded and, you know, they're not filtering what they, what they put out there. They're being very candid. Um, on the other hand, you know, it, it's got a cost for people too. Um, you know, as I mentioned, my interest in these sites came from a, a particular uh, school attack plan story. Um, that wasn't the only one by any means. Um, you go back through archives and uh, major uh, news sites and you'll find, you know, three or four in the last three years alone of this kind of activity. And again, uh, you know, the good thing was people were too candid on the sites, right? So the plan got out law enforcement was able to take action before lives were lost. Um, and uh, so there's a, lot, there's a lot out there to look at. Um, you know, that's the upside. We can prevent some bad things from happening. The downside is um, the amount of information out there uh, fosters uh, an increase in stalking, like the case I mentioned. Um, and a lot of people put out uh, more personal information than they need to and they don't realize how it may expose them. Uh, in the work that I do, uh, fraud investigators have become increasingly interested in these because, um, you know, again, it's amazing what people put out there. Um, so uh, lots of cases have been solved by just uh, looking for um, information that was out on these sites. Uh, you probably remember the story uh, from uh, Wired magazine, Kevin Polson, who uh, did a cross match of uh, the Department of Justice uh, sexual predator list with MySpace profiles, and he found some 700 plus uh, convicted sex felons uh, who had profiles on MySpace. Um, and in their own names, right? Because that's how we made the match. And I was left thinking, oh gosh, 
there's 700 uh, sexual predators on MySpace, and, and they're the stupid ones that weren't smart enough to use an alias. What about the smart ones? So again, you know, we know this. The internet is, uh, is uh, not a gated community. Um, and uh, you know, there you go. Um, for those of you who may be uh, new to these sites and, uh, and you're thinking about doing investigations on these sites, there's some cautions you should be aware of. Um, you know, the, the profiles frequently have inappropriate content. Um, it's a felony to download uh, child pornography, even if you're not intending to. So you can come across content that, strictly speaking, um, is illegal content. If you're doing investigations in a formal setting, uh, you know, say for a company or something, you're going to want to have procedures in place uh, to deal with this. You're going to want to think about this before it happens and have a plan, you know, not wait for it to happen and then call corporate counsel, what do we do, right? So uh, this is usually the area where, uh, when I'm doing the training, uh, a significant amount of conversation ensues because, uh, you know, the, the uh, corporate attorney in the room is kind of taken aback, well, how could it possibly be that in the line of uh, duty, you know, one of our employees would come across this material, but, you know, such as it is, it's the internet, uh, and, uh, and that is a, um, that is a risk. Uh, the guidance that uh, I've heard formulated that I think is responsible, but I'm not an attorney, is, um, uh, you know, a, if you will, a best practice would be to log when you're doing a, an investigation, right? If you come across problematic material, talk to your supervisor, clean it off your machine, you know, clean the cache, this kind of stuff, right? Document that. And that way, if it ever comes up after the fact, you know, you're clean with your management. I was doing an investigation, you know, I wasn't just surfing at lunch, right? Came across the stuff, cleaned it as soon as we saw it, you move on. But again, um, giving a little bit of thought to those things before it happens um, is, is the best way to handle it. Um, in terms of managing your time, you know, uh, just do the math, right? Um, some 150, 180 million profiles, maybe more at MySpace, um, and on down the list. We're talking hundreds upon hundreds of millions of profiles and pages and uh, just material, you know, beyond what you can paw through. So um, as an investigator, you're going to want to, you know, think about, okay, if I'm looking for something in particular, I'm going to search for 15 minutes if I come up empty, I'm moving on. There's nothing to catch here because, uh, you know, you can just you can blow a whole day and not really produce anything if you're not kind of disciplined about it and come at it with a, with a reasoned approach. Um, again, there's a lot of problematic content on these sites and for the non-technical user, uh, a lot of the problematic content is going to be invisible to you. Right? It's going to be JavaScript, it's going to execute in your browser without you knowing it, or it's going to attack one of your plugins, like the Flash plugin or something of this nature, and you're not even going to see what might be happening to your machine. So you really should consider um, some way of segregating investigative work from, say, normal work if you're on a corporate PC or a personal PC. Um, suggestions would include using something like a virtual browser, start it up, do the investigation work. When you close it down, you throw it away. Um, or uh, even I was having a conversation this morning and, uh, you know, separate machine in a separate cubicle only used for investigations. Maybe it's periodically re-imaged just for safety's sake, right? Um, but separate this kind of web surfing from normal work-oriented web surfing or your other kind of work because uh, you, this is a walk on the wild side, right? From a, from a corporate computing perspective, this is not, um, this is not what's expected. I, I remember the first conversation I had uh, with our corporate counsel where it was like, what do you mean they could come across this stuff? 
you know, and trying to explain. They're investigators. They'll go where it takes them, and, you know, it could take them anywhere. It's like, oh, what do we need to think about about this? So it's like, okay, here's, you know, here's a lot of things you need to think about. So <clears throat> in, in a corporate environment, um, looking for material on these sites, uh, that's often, often a place that management hasn't thought about, you know, and what you don't want to find is that all of the investigators' machines get baked and they're all cycling through the help desk and, uh, you know, getting re-imaged uh, over at, at desktop services or something because, you know, a little bit of planning wasn't done. Um, and again, you know, final caution, if you're doing this in a corporate environment and, and you're, um, especially if you're, you're not uh, technical, you know, there should be some procedures that are worked out, like logging when you're doing investigations. So if you come across illegal content, you know, you have cover uh, and things of that nature. Is there any questions on that? <clears throat> so some suggestions that I have um, in terms of time savers is um, I, I like to work uh, my searches down in Google until I'm down, you know, well below a thousand links, you know. When I'm down around 400, 500 links or less, then I figure I'm, I'm hitting gold. If I'm, if I'm up in the 10,000 range, then, you know, you're picking up targets in the wrong zip codes, states, and so forth, and you're really not honing in on where you should be. Um, from a, a time perspective, again, you know, if you're, if you're technical and you spend time with these sites, I don't, I don't need to give you any advice there. But if you're, if you're more on the business side and, and uh, you're just stepping into this stuff, uh, set a time limit, right? So that um, if you're not finding what aligns with the investigative clues that you're trying to follow up on, you cut your losses because the, uh, the internet um, is huge and you're, you're not going to get through it all. Um, from a, a safety uh, perspective, again, back to just safe browsing, uh, don't randomly, you know, promiscuously just click on all the links as you're going through these sites. If you stick to uh, the clue that you're following, you know, the name that you're tracking, the circle of friends that you're following, uh, it's not that you're less likely to run into problematic content, but at least you're not just getting way off the, off the track. Um, <clears throat> and the investigators that I've worked with have said uh, these are the kinds of things that they use to stay on track, to produce uh, results for the investigation uh, that are productive and uh, don't end up wasting a lot of time. Um, you know, most of the, most of the investigative uh, work that, feedback that I've gotten from them is that uh, it's only a small percentage of their work that's really productive on the internet. Um, you know, the, the classic gumshoe, go visit an accident scene, go interview the people, is still the primary way, uh, you know, to build a case to do an investigation. What this gives is an edge when there's material that's not going to come out by other means. And so that's all the more reason to just kind of keep tabs on how much time and how much resources is being spent here. This isn't a magic bullet uh, by any means. Uh, and, and any of you who are familiar with these sites knows that um, in some respects the quality of their content that you're going to pull back on these sites is, uh, is lower than you'll get in real world interaction. You know, people using false names, posting false information, or just not posting complete information. Um, so it, it's, uh, it can be a mixed bag there. Um, and again, along with um, sticking to what you're trying to do, you know, you don't want to waste time on advertisements and stuff that isn't the links that follow you to the next set of content. And you want to avoid content entry, right? Because the goal here <coughs> is not to post a comment on, on the blog, right? It's to get stuff out of the blog. So if you find yourself wandering into interfaces where you're being asked for content, you know, 
Wrong metric, right? Wrong direction. That's not where you want to be going on the site. So <clears throat> when you're actually laying out how you're going to navigate these sites and collect information in support of an investigation, uh, there are a couple of things to remember. Uh, if you're not familiar with these sites, you have to remember that the profiles are very dynamic. I've seen over and over and over again profiles where the, the profile gets a different background and different color scheme every day. And some of the content is changing on the profile every day. So if this is part of an ongoing investigation or if this is part of building a case, you may need to visit every day and take a snapshot because the key data, you, you can't assume that the key data you need is going to be there three weeks later. It may appear for a day and be gone. Um, and that's especially true when we start talking about um, delving deeper into profiles where, for example, based on the nature of a site, like MySpace, if you sign into the site, you see more content. If you don't sign into the site, you can only see kind of the front facade of the profile. So if you want more data, you're going to have to sign in. Well, when you sign in, they can put things on their profile that can track who came to the, who came to the profile and who viewed it. So suddenly you find that you as the investigator are giving up some information. You may tip your prospect off and then you may start seeing a whole bunch of content starting to disappear. Um, so again, th this becomes, a, you know, it's, it can become a little bit of a cat and a mouse game where you got to think before I go and look at this, I got to think about how am I interacting with the site? What am I giving up? And, and now when I go visit this profile, uh, you know, is it, is it one that I can look at without signing in and I can stay anonymous? Or is it one where if I touch the profile, I had to sign in, you know, to see the blog entry or whatever. And now uh, some of the content that I may be concerned about is starting to disappear, right? Um, also, in the environment that I work in, uh, the integrity of the process is almost paramount. In other words, they would rather not find the information than find the information in a way that would jeopardize the investigation. So where I work, the directive is you will sign in with a name that identifies you. You won't use an alias or, you know, cause, because if you ever have to present that in court, <clears throat> you want to be able to say, I, you know, it's me. I went to the site. I got this information on the up and up. I didn't, you know, I didn't hack the site. I didn't get content I wasn't entitled to. Here's the content, and bang, and it's clean. You know, there's never a, a challenge around. Well, did did you use a pretense to get this? You know, did you? Is it, you know, is this entrapment in some way? Uh, did you know? Did you communicate with the target? All those kinds of things, right? So. Um, again, those are things that you'll want to be thinking about depending on the purpose of your investigation and what you're looking for about how you conduct yourself on the site, how you gather the information, and how you show that this is what you collected and this is when you collected it and that uh, you know, your artifacts haven't been tampered with. Um, <clears throat> when you visit these uh, profiles, you've got to remember, you know, they call it a web for a reason, right? It's all interlinked. Um, there are going to be a lot of times when you want to follow uh, the follow the links. Um, and uh, I, you know, you want to follow it down to the point where you're not getting any more data related to your investigation. Um, I'm not going to spend much on this because this audience, uh, I'm sure, is uh, very comfortable with, uh, with searching. Um, so we'll skip that. Um, one uh, encouragement I have for you is be sure to use the search site of the site you're on. So for example, um, Go and use Google or use Yahoo or use another search engine when you're trying to find your initial targets. But if you find a MySpace profile, use the MySpace search. 
<coughs> for further follow-up. Um, just think about how the sites are constructed, right? Uh, when the MySpace search engine uh, traverses its site, it has direct, unfettered access to the back-end database, right? Because it's the same site. It's the same database. So you may find either that there's more cached material there uh, than Google can see, right? Uh, or more historical information or more hits that weren't spidered by Google that will enhance your investigation. So don't uh, don't limit yourself, oh, I, I searched Google, I'm done, or I searched Yahoo, I'm done. Remember to use the search engine of the site of your target links because those may have a different view of, um, of what, you've, what you're looking at, right? Um, and use the cached links, right? We talked about how critical information you may be looking for um, can disappear the next day. Well, the cached link in the search engines like Yahoo and Google, <coughs> excuse me, um, may have yesterday's profile or last week's profile. And that may have the picture you need, right? Or the name you were looking for. Or uh, an, a mention of the incident that you're concerned with. So uh, just remember to you know, cast a broad enough uh, view of the content and the links that you're using to, to gather your information that, that you don't miss a treasure trove that could be just one link away. <coughs> so, um, you know, I frequently start out with, uh, with Google and um, I'll use, usually I'll use more search terms than this, but this is just, you know, an example, right? <clears throat> you can use the site tag to limit what you're looking at so that if I, if I know I'm looking at a circle of friends that's on MySpace, right, I can cut out all the other stuff by just using the site tag um, and then go from there. Um, one of the things you're going to have to grapple with is do you want to sign into the site? I mentioned this before, um, you know, particularly on um, sites like MySpace and uh, Facebook, if you don't sign in, you're really constrained in terms of what you can see. Um, at MySpace, as long as the profile is not designated private, if you sign in, the, uh, the picture albums open up, the um, historical comments beyond the first page open up and the blog entries open up. So there's a lot of material that can lead you to other links or other friends or pictures that are going to say, ooh, I, you know, I've got another person of interest, right? Um, just by signing in. You have to weigh that against what you're giving up in anonymity once you do that, right? Because uh, they can put stuff on their profile that will feed back to them which MySpace users are visiting the profile. And you just have to know uh, that may be a consideration for you. You have to decide does the, does the benefit uh, outweigh the cost. Um, so any questions so far? Yep. You mentioned using your, you know, your real identity um, so that you can say, uh, you know, I wasn't, there was no pretext, I wasn't trying to be someone, you know, pretend I was their friend in order to get them to, to leave a message or something. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it seems to me if you're using your real name and that's showing up there, you know, that puts yourself at risk. And what about just logging, you know, I'm opening a MySpace account as, you know, blah, 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 72, and... You know, a name that is clearly not pretending to be anyone. They could claim to be pretending to be anyone and using that. Is that something So I'll, I'll try to repeat that for the tape since I, I, I've got the mic. But um, basically, are, are you putting yourself at risk by using your personal identity <clears throat> when you sign into one of these sites for an investigation? Or should you use something generic and put that in the, you know, the company's uh, investigative log Right, or something like that that says, you know, I was using 
investigate 72 as my ID instead of Steve Patton, right? <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, here is one of those areas where I think um, if you're doing formal investigations for some reason, that should be part of the policy book, right, or the procedures. That exactly that kind of question should be made clear. The, my employer it landed on, you know, be right up front. Let, let's, uh, let's not uh, let there be any um, possible accusation, right, of, of pretense or pretexting, right? <clears throat> um, there could be valid circumstances uh, to come at it from a different approach, right? Uh, probably three-letter agencies aren't doing that, but I don't know. So, uh, uh, but I think the key thing from an investigator's perspective is, do you, do you know your boundaries for your organization? <laughs> Are you following them? And if they haven't asked themselves some of the questions that I've mentioned here, you know, can you escalate that to management and get, get an answer, right? What should I do if I come across child porn? What should I do if I need to sign in? What should I do if the target contacts me? Do I ignore it? Do I respond? Do I say yes, you know, in my official capacity for company X, I am investigating you, or, you know, do I ignore that, right? All, those, those are the kinds of things that should be asked and answered before you begin so that, you, you know, you're on solid ground uh, in terms of how you're conducting your investigation for whoever you're conducting it for, right? Other questions? Okay. So if you, if you haven't seen a MySpace profile before, here's a, here's a good example. Um, and, uh, you know, you'll see some demographic information, you know, male, 24 years old, a location. You get a good sense of a hobby, right? Um, You've got some pictures uh, up on the, on the right-hand side there. Uh, if we were to scroll down, you'd see pictures running down the, the profile. Um, all of this, right, from an investigator standpoint, is creating that picture and maybe leading you out of the links and saying, you know, okay, am I in the zone or, or not in the zone for, for what I'm, I'm looking at? <coughs> um, Here's an example of a blog entry on, uh, on a MySpace profile, okay? So for this, you'd have to sign in and then hit the blog link. And uh, here's, you know, vehicle for sale, right? Um, again, following the trail, uh, I've got more material I can go after here. So here's the, here's the car offering, right? And, uh, you know, if I were investigating something that happened with this vehicle, this would all be very valuable information, right? It, there's condition of the vehicle at a certain point in time, uh, you know, locations, uh, ownership, some information about maybe how it was maintained. Uh, I'm getting a lot of stuff that, that might be relevant, um, uh, this kind of stuff is very relevant to the investigators I work with, right? <clears throat> Your mileage may vary. <laughs> um, and, you know, I even got an email out of it. So now I'm getting more stuff that I can search for, link together. Um, not all of it's going to be links, right? Some of it may be text, location, phone numbers, and so on and so forth. But, you know, this is the bread and butter of putting a case together. Um, one of the search sites I like is uh, Zava Search. I've found it, um, it can be amazing in, uh, in uh, address information. In fact, uh, Zava Search can often give you um, historical uh, addresses. You'll see three or four addresses and then there's a date of uh, when the address was recorded. You see here uh, when it was recorded, so you can, you can almost see, oh, you know, moved from apartment to this, to a house, back to an apartment, right? You can, you can piece together a lot of stuff here. Um, that thing hauls back addresses, phone numbers, uh, other people at the same address, uh, scary, 
<laughs> and if you hit the map link, bink, right? <laughs> Ain't the web great? Um, sometimes I've found um, the profiles are hard to read. So here are uh, a couple of different ways to make uh, a hard to read profile a little bit easier to read. Uh, some of this comes from the fact that sites like MySpace let you choose any color scheme, any font you want, uh, even if it's completely illegible. Um, and some of it comes from uh, intentionally trying to mask uh, some of the information. Um, this first tip, uh, I, was em I was embarrassed how I had to find it, you know. I'm a programmer by background and immediately, you know, delved into, well, change the style and, you know, do view source and clip the style tags out of the HTML and all this stuff, right? And it was the sergeant from the town next door. She said, oh, when we have that problem, we just take the mouse and drag it over the text and it appears, you know, like that. Like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll put that in my, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes the easiest approach is the best. <laughs> um, but if the, if the drag and select uh, uh, technique doesn't work, um, Mozilla, Firefox, and Internet Explorer both have some uh, options where you can change the style of how the page is presented. That can sometimes get you over the hump. Um, if you're really a glutton for punishment, you can you know, do view source. Clip the style tags out, save the page, you know, and, and redisplay it. Um, and um, for MySpace in particular, um, you can sign into, if it's comments that you're having trouble viewing, okay, you can sign into MySpace, uh, go to the top of the comment area, click on view all. And now you're seeing all of the historical comments and they, they display it on a very plain style page where it's really easy to see. It, it takes it away from the personalized style of the user and shows it in kind of this generic uh, MySpace format. <coughs> so, you know, here's, uh, here's an example of it, it looks illegible. You can't read the comments. But if you go and navigate uh, to the comment page, bang, you know, the style changes and now I can read the text. <clears throat> One other thing about MySpace, um, on the front profile page, you're only going to see the first 50 comments. Um, but uh, lots and lots, like when I did um, analysis of a local high school, some 500 profiles on a, on a local high school, um, <clears throat> in about a 18 month uh, period, those 500 profiles had 145,000 comments. So I say that to illustrate that if you're just looking at the first 50 comments, you're missing the story because many, many of these profiles, you can see when, when you uh, pull up the profile, it'll show you how many comments that person has. And uh, very frequently it'll be, you know, 2,000, 5,000, 7,000 comments. Um, if you sign in and do view all, then you get, you have to navigate page by page. It might be 50 pages of comments, but you know, you get, you get to see all the comments and then you can pick the time frame you're looking for and so forth. <coughs> also on uh, MySpace, if you're looking at a comment and you click on the picture to the left, you go off to that profile and then you can see, you know, the other side of the conversation, right? What comment was posted in response to the one you just read on this one. Um, <clears throat> if you're following a three or four way conversation, then it's kind of a pain because you're going to have to, you know, click around to follow the conversation. But if it's two people, there are some scripts out there. I released some scripts last summer um, in uh, Perl that just navigate, the, they pull back all the comments of the of the two profiles you give and then uh, sort them by date and time, right? So now you can see the conversation in chronological order. <coughs> Pictures. Um, 
Pictures are a really valuable part of the profiles. Um, a lot of the content of these profiles is in pictures. Um, MySpace and other sites host entire albums. Um, so there can be truckloads of content there that can be very valuable to investigators. Um, <clears throat> one of the things to pay attention to is the URLs for the photos. Now typically, if you post a photo on a MySpace profile, the HTML link that's attached to it is to the, you know, the front page of the hosting site, right? And if you click on the photo, you go to Photo Bucket, the front page, not the album, and not that picture. Um, but if you view the, the content uh, of, you know, the source of the page, you may be able to find a lot more content. Excuse me. So <clears throat> here we're looking at, you know, just scroll down on one of these profiles. You can see picture after picture after picture. <clears throat> Each one of these has a unique URL from the album where it came from. But if you delve a little deeper and, and view source, <clears throat> you can see the different links for the different pictures. And sometimes, like this uh, 916 one, it has um, album uh, tags, you know, in the, in the path. You can see album in the path there. Um, so this is an area where you may want to, you know, drag and paste that in your browser and just navigate to the picture and then see if you can play with the URL. So uh, this varies by picture site, and um, it runs the gamut from no can do to aha. You know, in this case, if you cut the picture off the end of the URL and just leave it going to the album number, you get the directory of the entire album. So off of, you know, I may be looking at a MySpace profile with 10 pictures, and you know, it's right where I want to be investigating. It's the right date time period, it's the right content, but I'm not quite seeing what I need to see. Well, go view the source, see if it's coming from an album, see if you can get to the album, because in this case, there were 400 pictures here. So now, you know, I have a, a better shot of finding what I'm trying to find. Um, so a little bit about the hosting sites. Um, Image Shack was featured in the, in the view source before. They don't seem to offer albums, you know. You upload a picture, they assign a unique um, link. It just is what it is. You can get to the one picture, but, uh, you know, I haven't found a way to get between collections of pictures. Um, Tiny Pick seems to be the same thing. Uh, Photo Bucket, on the other hand, does organize pictures into the owner's albums, um, but the owner can protect them, um, but not all owners do. So again, this will be, you know, try it, see if it works. If the owner did not um, protect the album and the album is still public, then you can troll around. Um, if it's protected, then you're done. We're, we're not doing the <laughs> bypass access thing here. So. Um, so some of them are wide open, some of them depend on the album owner, some of them don't, al don't offer albums at all. Uh, but it takes going through the view source of the original profile and picking through to see if you can find out where these photos are coming from and then finding out whether you've got an opportunity there or not. And um, most of these sites have gotten feedback from their users and others that uh, privacy is an issue, like that's good. Uh, it's not good for an investigator, but it's good for the user. Um, and so uh, in most of these cases, there are ways to lock down the profile and, and uh, cause the content to become private. Um, again, here, we're not, we're not hacking sites. Um, so if you, if you run up against the, the bathroom door lock, it's, you're done. Um, <clears throat> so, any questions? Yep. Um, you see that, that example of the, the, you know, the sergeant from the town next door that said, you know, they had this deluge of information from uh, you know, teenagers and they used that to kind of deal with hate crime. 
I'm kind of wondering, do you think that they sometimes get used to that so that those that completely eschew giving out their information become more suspicious or they might want to dig deeper into those that like, they don't know about because they can't have, don't have a profile? Um, you know, I, uh, so I guess the question is, does the, uh, does the, the public nature of a lot of these uh, sites cause authorities to kind of expect that? And when they don't see that level of disclosure, do they go looking? Um, I think in this case, I mean, these, these are not criminal investigations for the most part. You know, when, you're, when I'm talking about the town next door, that's misdemeanor stuff, really. Um, and so I, I haven't seen an appetite there. And, you know, usually these are uh, overworked, underpaid police officers who are just trying to, you know, keep things on the uh, moving forward and, and solve complaints for town people when they come forward. Um, if you talk about three-letter agencies, though, um, I won't purport to know what they're thinking or not thinking, but, uh, you know, it, that, that's a whole different level, right? If, if there's any kind of a sense of a national security issue, it's a totally different ballgame. Uh, you know, as I mentioned for, uh, for my workplace, um, it's, it, it's pretty light, right? Uh, it, it's not heavy-handed stuff, in fact. Uh, it, if anything, they've, they've intentionally made it uh, uh, light touch just to keep things clean on the legal side, right? So um, uh, I think it depends on the venue and it depends on the threat. The more serious the threat, I would think, you know, that's a different kind of ball game. But in, in what I've seen locally and, uh, and commercially, you know, people are looking to just get their work done, right? And this is, a t you know, for the investigators I work with, this is just a faster way to get their work done and get the case closed. Other questions? Yep. I was asked a little while ago if there was a way to get the, um, the home IP address of the MySpace profile owner. I was thinking there might be some way of sending them an image that you, you hosted at your own server that you can track when they accessed it. Is there that come into play at all? Or mm -hmm. is there a way of doing that? Well, uh, I'm sure unless, unless you're using a tool, right, you're going to give up your source IP to them. Um, the other way around, um, I don't know. Because remember, I mean, the investigator is, uh, is looking to collect information that's been posted. So unless, unless there's some means by which the, the owner of the profile has posted their IP uh, or they're hosting photos on their home machine, that, you know, but that's, uh, I don't see that. I mean, I see the big, the big hosting sites, right? The photo buckets, that's where all this stuff is. So, um, you know, never say never, but uh, I'm not seeing that as a particularly high risk. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, I, on the other hand, when, uh, you know, after you've visited three profiles and you see Tom, you kind of say, he's not the guy I'm looking for. <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're, it is necessary to interpret the content you're pulling back. And, uh, you know, our investigators, uh, they see it all the time. Just just because there's a link doesn't even mean there's an association, right? Um, from, a, from a legal perspective, that doesn't make a case. There's got to be, you know, you're standing next to the car, right? <laughs> you're looking down at the body or whatever that, that makes the link that, that really moves something forward. I, 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 don't, I haven't seen any 
problems yet with guilt by association, but I don't know, never say never. So I think, are we? Uh, yeah, we're okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, I, there are some uh, valuation sheets. If uh, you'd like to fill one out, I have some extras here. Um, you can give them to me and drop them. Thanks.